Hello, this is Dara Thomas. This is the second video in my series uh, for small stacks online cash games. Um, in this series, I'm going through all the um, the fundamental concepts that are important when playing uh, six handed cash games. Um, this is going to be the second video. Here, we're going to look at um, six handed strategy. What should be your general strategy and approach to the game? As with all the videos, I'll be playing two tables of five cents. 10 cents, no limit hold them on full tilt. I've just literally logged on to these tables, so I don't know anything about these players. Here on the right, um, I just had 6-4 offsuit um, in the big blind. Um, I bet the flop when he uh, he checked me with my bottom pair. Um, I'm not really sure what to make of his play here. It's quite strange, but I'm just going to fold because I don't really have much. Five clubs are going to be straight flush, but um, I'm not going to call a pop bet to see that um so this this um this video will be going through a number of different topics um this is all about you know the general type of approach that you need to take to be successful um we're going to talk about pre-flop and after the flop um in the last video we talked mainly about hand selection so now we're going to talk about what to do with those hands um we're going to Gonna go through some you know some of the general ethos is um it's important to have. Um <clears throat> and we'll see uh we'll see what type of interesting situations we can get into. Um that will that will hopefully uh show the value of the things that we're talking about. Um what we're gonna talk about a lot is you want to be the one winning the as many pots as possible. Um you want to be the ones betting or raising, not the one calling. Um, you want to keep up a constant level of aggression so that as a matter of course, you tend to take down a lot of pots. Now, um, okay, so here on the left, I'll come back to what I was saying in a minute. Here on the left, uh, it's folded to the guy who's just checked his small blind. So it's an easy raise with the good hand, 10 queen suited. Um, he calls, and he calls a bet on the flop, once he calls about on the flop, his range is quite tight. I think he has got, you know, he in theory he should have an ace or a king or a flush draw. Uh, it's possible he could have a six. Um, I checked the turn because I've hit a queen, so there's not really much need for me to bluff anymore. I could still hit another queen or a jack for a straight. Possibly ten would give me the best hand. Um, and he bets at one. There's no reason to think he's bluffing. I'd say he has a weak ace here. Um, so I'm just going to fold. So... Um, the thing to understand: a lot of players, um, a lot of players learn how to play poker. They learn in, uh, you know, they learn one form of poker, and then they find it very difficult to compete at any other form. Um, Six-handed online cash games. Um, it's all about efficiency. It's all about winning pots. Um, th the players will often be quite bad, but they they'll never be. Um, possibly as as bad as the players you'll encounter playing live um especially if you frequent the irish casinos um players don't tend to be as bad uh, as they, they are live and they're not as bad as they were a few years ago um even the worst players have have improved um and most of the normal players have improved vastly people don't stack off quite as easily as, as they used to it used to be in the old days um a few years ago the mid stakes, you would just wait until you had a good hand and then pull all your chips in um, and hope the the fish didn't enjoy it. But it's gotten a bit more complicated than that because, well, well, I'm not going to fold here because people have learned um, basic strategy. So you need to be more efficient. And one thing that you can do is take down a lot of small and medium sized pots um, and that will add greatly to your win rate. Um, these are the type of it's the kind of small, the small and medium pots are often. Uh, how do I put this? It's, you know, in a good way of explaining it is, for, say for example, it's folded to you on the bottom of kings, and um, you raise, and someone else free raises, etc., etc. You get all in, and one of the blinds has aces. Um, the the guy with aces has has won your you know, has won your stack uh, from you, um, but in the long run. That is not a situation where he's going to make much money because if the hands were reversed, 
um, he would have lost just the same as well. Like he's not going to fold kings there. So in once you play ten or twenty or fifty thousand hands, you don't really make a, a long term profit from the kings versus aces hands or the aces versus kings because unless you play them better than your opponents, and generally people just get all in pre flop with them, um, you, you you won't come out with a profit or a loss. Um, so in a lot of big pots, um, there isn't that much equity traded. Um, because players, you know, a lot of times you just have two hands that are too good to fold. So you get all in, you see who has the best hand. Um, it, it's the small pots, the medium pots where, um, for example, here on the right now, you know, this is a small pot. People aren't paying much attention. Um, but this is somewhere where you can really change your win weight. Um, I think based on the odds I'm getting, this is an easy call. He could easily be bluffing. Or value bend the three. There's been no action on any other street. Okay, so you happen to have a jack, but I think over the course of time that's a, a good call. Um, because there's so many other things he could have. It's unlikely that he checked a king or a jack that many times. He did manage to, to check a jack. But considering the other things he could have, um, I think that call is going to show a profit. I'm just going to complete here. <coughs> so that's um, a huge great flop for my hand. Uh, I've got a, an open-ended straight flush draw. I had one of them in the last video as well. Um, okay, so um, his, his play here, what I do, if I thought there was any chance he'd fold a jack, I might not have a jack, I'd raise. I think he probably does have a jack, so there's not much point in me raising the flop because uh, he is the best hand and... I don't think he's going to fold. Uh, his play is really weird here. Um, but I'm just going to raise and hope to get it in. Hopefully he's in, he's trying to induce that raise with just a lone jack. Although he... Mm, I'm beginning to suspect he just has an eight. Yeah. I so I messed that up on the flop to a certain extent. I thought he was stronger than he was. So uh, I just called his raise hoping to hit a flush or straight. Uh, but it turns out he didn't really have a, a strong hand. I'm just going to fold here. Yeah, so in some ways the big pots play themselves. Now that's not to say you shouldn't um, you shouldn't concentrate on them or whatever, but it's important to take care of the little pots. And one of the reasons it's very important is players don't tend to care that much, they don't pay much attention. So it's not hard to win them, um, and it's not hard to outplay your opponents in them either. Um, like a good player, a player who is absolutely killing a level, um, will win at about. 20 blinds per 100 hands. Um, so if you're playing 51, that's only about, it's about 20, or it's about $15 an hour or something like that. Um, so if you think about those, if you can just win a few little pots here and there um, more than your opponents, that is going to make a big difference to your win rate. Um, so where all this is leading to is that you should play in a way that gives you the best chance to win pots at every opportunity. So what that means is you don't limp into the pot because when you're limping, you're making a mistake because you're making it hard for you to win the blinds. Um, okay, so here on the right, I've raised with eight nine. That's a great flop from my hand. Well, it's a good, good flop. I've got a straight draw, a good shot. And I also have a, a flush draw. So my equity is good enough here that I'd bet, and if anyone raises me, I'll go all in. Um, the only downside to it is I know over cards. And I didn't take it down. So it comes down to, yeah, so as I was saying, it comes down to very simple things. Pre-flop, you don't limp in, because when you limp in, um, you're not trying to take down the blinds. Taking down the blinds is a good thing. You should be happy to take down the blinds. Um, if you, you know, as I said before, if you can take down more blinds than your opponents, that is that is going to really help your win rate and make you a successful player. Um, so if you're the first into the pot, I would it's never a good idea to limp in. Um, just before I go any further, this is all talking about online cash games where the stack is about a hundred big blinds. This is the, the best type. This is the strategy that's needed to do best in those games. But if the variables are different, a different strategy might be required. For example, if you're playing online or offline, it typically happens offline, and players have thousands of big blinds, then you don't need to worry about uh, pre-flop so much because taking down the blinds, if someone's sitting there with a thousand euros and you have a thousand euros and you're playing one, two, 
there's no real benefit to taking down the blinds. You don't care about taking down the blinds. You care about taking their stock. Um, so a different strategy might be required, and it's it's fine to to be calling preflop, um, because you're hoping to make the money up later. But online, hundred people on cash cams, it's not that type of game. It's rare that you should be calling to try and hit someone's stack. You should be kind of trying to win the pot yourself if you can, and if not, just letting it go. Now that's a broad generalization, but it's um, roughly uh, how you should play. So here are raised with Ace Nine. And do my best to win the pot. One of the things I'll talk about though is there's a, a very fine line of how aggressive you should be. Uh, and it's very important not to not go over that. Because being over aggressive is probably worse than being under aggressive. Mm, let me think about that. Well, I'd have to think about that um, to decide probably, but they're both very bad. They're almost as bad as each other. Um, so it's important when you're trying to win pots don't go too far you want to you want to exp you want to use the minimum amount of ammunition or your chips to kind of win the maximum so what that means is a lot of smallish bluffs some medium bluffs very rarely big bluffs um you know it's the type of thing that comes with experience you'll gradually find a level um where somebody has reached a point where they've called so much there's no point in bluffing them anymore so that's why um if you, if you look at all the hands you played together, you should make a lot of one barrels. Um, for example, if you, one or two people limp into the bot, you bet out on the flop, but nothing or very little. That's a very good bluff because there's a very good chance someone doesn't have, um, no one has anything. And it's the type of bluff you make depending on the board texture on your opponents and that type of thing. But it's a very good bluff because before you bet, and if, if everyone's checked, there's a very good chance that, uh, nobody has anything at all. Um, so their ranges are very weak, so it makes a profitable bluff. Once somebody has called one bet, their range becomes much tighter. For example, say you raise preflop, and then they checked you and you bet the flop. That's a profitable bet because they can. There's so many hands they can have that are, uh, you know, drawn dead or can't possibly call a bet. Just would have no interest in that board. For example, pocket threes is is not going to call a bet on a two seven jack board. Most of the time, it's very rare that it would. It's like ace five of spades. It's not going to call a bet there. Um, so it's possible. However, once someone calls a bet, <clears throat> the range has been narrowed by the flop. So a flop bet may not be, or it's not going to be immediately as profitable. Sorry, sorry. Uh, the, once they call the flop bet, so the turn bet is not going to be as profitable to bet with, with uh, nothing or with no regard to your opponent. So you should make a lot of kind of one barrel bluffs, which is on the f on the flop. And um, then the two barrel bluff is when you go to the turn. You should make much less of them because you're going to be up against a much tighter range. It's going to be much less profitable. And then following on from that, if a person calls about in the flop and they call about in the turn, it's very likely they have a hand good enough to call you on the river as well. Either they have a hand good enough or they just don't believe you. Um, so by the river, it's uh, it's usually a good idea to give up at that stage. Now there are, I'm talking again in generalizations. There are times where you should go ahead in the river, and if you're playing against a good player who realizes you are unlikely to bluff on the river, then it's a brilliant time to bluff. Um, but that's it's very rare circumstances. Um, so so generally, I find, or um, and there's good reasons as well. The river is the worst time to bluff someone. When you bet on the river, you, um, you're you telling your opponent exactly how much he needs to call. He knows he doesn't have to call anymore. He can just decide, hmm, is my hand good enough or not? Or it might be. I'd like to see what he has. And he calls. Um, here on the right, I've uh, raised a king 10. Flop nothing. But I'm going to try and win the pot with a continuation board. That's a good board to continuation bet because it can safely represent the queen. Um, hmm. So he's called me here. So here I've gotten lucky and I'm fairly sure of the best hand. Um, but hopefully if you can call me on the flop, hopefully you can call me again here. Sometimes I would check that, uh, but I think a queen might well call another bet. Um, I check there pretending I don't have a king and then bet, bet the river. Um, so just going back to what... 
I mean, going back to a more general uh, look at what you're doing, you want to win as many pots as you can, um, small pots and medium pots, and you always want to play in a style um, that is conducive to taking down pots um, without costing yourself too much. Um, it's important to just sometimes realize, okay, somebody has made a firm commitment to this hand. I'm just going to let them have it. Typical examples of what you, what you want to think about is if you bet and get called and nothing changes, it, it, that's not a, that's usually not a good time to bet because if they've called you before, why wouldn't they call you again? Now, again, there is a, there are exceptions to that. But especially when you're playing kind of like a guy who's loose and not great, if he's called you once, he's probably going to call you again unless something changes. If you look at this hand here, um, here now, had I been totally bluffing on what well, I was bluffing on the flop, but had I totally been, let's go and there. Had I had something like Ace Three or whatever, and I bet the flop he calls, that is a great board to to fire again on, uh, a great turn card because something has changed, and now I can represent. Um, a king. Now, as I had, and I had a king, so I didn't have to represent anything. Um, but that would be an example of the board changing. This is a profitable bluff. If the river, or sorry, if the turn was a three or an eight or any card like that, it would be a bad card to continue on because the board's so dry. He's called one bet. He probably has a queen. There's no no other cards going to scare him except an ace or a king. So you just you're just putting money in. Um, Bad, if you know what I mean. He's very unlikely to fold. Okay. So here again on the right, I've, I've raised and flopped nothing. Uh, at this stage, I... Mm, okay, well, I've kind of talked myself into this. I do need to continue here. The problem with this bet is I bet the last time the king occurred. He might start to not believe me at this stage. He, may, he doesn't know... Um, that I had the king that time. Now, I've been so aggressive now that I think I can fire this bet here. The flush has come, the king has come, I think he's got a queen or something, and I think this can be a profitable bet. Okay, so I was a little bit nervous there because I didn't want to uh, make a stupid bluff on camera, but I think, given that his range um, was probably wider on the turn, because I'd been so aggressive, that I could probably bet that river, because I think, I think he's called me on the flop quite light. I think he's called me on a queen or a seven or something. Well, queen isn't that light, but I think the king plus the flush draw coming in is going to scare him off a queen enough that I can possibly bet the river. Something's changed, so I can fire on the river representing either the king or the flush draw. It doesn't, he doesn't need to understand which. Um, had the flush draw not come in, I probably would have just given up. So here on the right, I've raised the ace-queen. Now, I've been so aggressive um, that I'm definitely not going to bluff here. Um, one, one very important skill in poker is learning when enough is enough, like learning when you've used your credibility. Like, I've used my credibility here. Um, I've been betting very aggressively. I haven't shown any cards down. I did actually have uh, quite good hands some of the time, but that doesn't matter if they don't get showed down. Um, so that was a situation where I, I, I'm just going to give up. Um, here I've got sixes, so I'm going to raise raise portfolio. Um, so there's um, there's certain types of hands as well in which uh, I like to be. I think you should be very aggressive with, and it's a very common mistake where people aren't aggressive with it. Uh, here I'm not. Again, I've no. Uh, you know, my image is probably a little bit bad. So I'm, I'm just going to check. It's a very bad board. And I'm just going to let them have it. I don't want to put money in. I need to have to fold it. Um, here on the right, uh, my image is totally different. Um, and I don't, I think his bet is quite weak. And I'm going to try and win the pot with a raise. Usually when a player kind of donks out like that, it's kind of a sign of weakness. Um, something like, He'll have pocket sevens or something and will be trying to find out where he is. Now, from time to time, it can be very strong or top air or something like that. But a lot of, I generally find, uh, you know, not good, not high stakes, that a, a, a bet out like that with no history is a weak hand. It could be something like Ace King that should have re raised P flop and is now trying to see if he's got the best hand. Uh, no, that's not it. 
yeah, so when he bets there, I don't think he's very strong. Um, I don't want to just call because I can't even beat ace high. Um, so he can have some like twos where he's definitely going to fold to raise, but he actually technically has the best hand. So I just like to raise there. Um, and also I have a good bit of equity because I can hit a king or a queen. Um, also, if I raise, you know, you can be you can be a very profitable spot if you, you raise there, the guy calls, and then you hit a king or a queen because he doesn't necessarily give you credit for it because it doesn't make sense for you to have it kind of. Um, so it's going to fold here. Yeah, so one... Um, one type of hand that you know if you understand this type of hand then you'll understand uh, this type of strategy you need um it's drawing hands a huge mistake that happens all the time over and over again i'll come back to that mistake in a minute here i've flopped a great hand uh flush drawing a good shot if he raises me i would uh, just go all in um because my equity is so good now, this has totally changed things because that 10 is an absolutely terrible card. And uh, again, I've kind of used my credibility. I don't want to raise him again. Um, I think he has an ace or a 10. So again, I don't want to raise him. I'm just going to call this tiny bet. And um, okay. So I've got two decisions here. On the right, I'm going to call the king green. Um, here on the left, I am going to call this because I think he could easily have an ace. He could have a 10 and less likely a 9, uh, but I think it's an easy call, really. Um, he's got green jack. Uh, here on the right, um, let's just check what happened. Didn't tell me. Raising the 10s. He's just started firing out uh, at this board. Uh, I've, quite, I've got top pair with a pretty good kicker. Um, okay, this is a lovely type of bet where I don't have to think very much here. There's no value in raising. Um, the bet's far too small to consider folding, so it's an easy call. That's a, you know, my opponent made my hand, made the hand very easy for me uh, with his river bet. Now, um, I don't think a, a bigger bet would have necessarily been that great with his hand because he doesn't need to bluff me. Um, but it was a nice size bet for me. Um, I'm just going to throw away the 2-3. Uh, again, here, I don't want to try, you know, I don't have anything. I'm not going to try and bluff this guy. I'm going to give him a little while. He just seems to keep potting it every time I check to him, though. Um, so that's something I would definitely not make a note of because it's a short-term thing, but uh, I would use that against him. Um, I could about check raise the next time I have a hand. So here we've got it. <coughs> Excuse me. Here we've got an interesting situation. have uh, undergone raise. I haven't played any hands against this guy. I'm just going to call. Now, one of the reasons I think a call here is good is because I want big fish in the, in the pot. He seems to be playing every hand, and he's not very good. Um, so I don't really want to scare him out. And against an under-the-gun raise, I mean, I would often re-raise ace-queen, but um, not knowing anything about this guy. I haven't seen him play a hand yet. I'm just trying to think. Um, so he, he could be playing pretty tight. And that's a bit of an awkward flop. Okay, so I'm going to um, bet this. If I was to get raised by B Shizzle, I would just go all in. Uh, he doesn't have enough money. I'm not going to consider it. He definitely could have loads of worse hands. Um, you know, King, Queen, Queen, 10, any of those hands. If Tilted Rag was to raise me, I would definitely fold because if he raised me, he probably has pocket jacks, pocket queens, pocket aces. He's raised under the gun. Now he's check raising. Um, that nine is quite a good card for me. Um, at this stage, hmm, yeah, so again, the, the situation is the same, um, I'm going to bet just more than half the pot, uh, I am, I am a little bit concerned that the Tilted Rag may be slow playing something, so if he was to go all in there, despite the good odds I'd be getting, I would fold, but um, I'm betting an amount here that is committing B-Shizzle, uh, Tilted Rag can't bluff me now, um, so he has to play honestly, and he just folds. Okay, and that two cards are good. At this stage, my hand has to be best. So it's, well, it doesn't really matter whether it is or not, it's only 75 cents. Um, or, you know, one tenth of a bind. He's already put the rest in, so let's have a check. Uh, no. King Queen. Yeah.
So if you see here, so going back to what I was just about to talk about, drawing hands. Now, one huge mistake, and if a player ever does this, you know they don't understand how to play uh, the game they're playing. Um, they will flop a draw, you, you know, a good draw, something like a reasonably good draw anyway, something like Queen Jack on a 9 10 board. You know, that's a pretty good draw. You know, you have eight outs uh, to the nuts. There's no flush draw. Um, you know, it's a good draw. And they will do something like check, call. They'll check and then call the buttons bet. So if, if, if a typical hand would be two donks uh, limp into the pot. One guy has Queen Jack, one guy has Ace 2. Uh, the fuck comes up 9, 10, something. Um, the, the blinds check, uh, Queen Jack checks, and then the button decides to have a pop at it and bets a dollar or two dollars, you know, I'm talking about 51. Um, and so the, so the Queen Jack then calls the bet. Then the turns are blank and he checks again. And the ace guy decides, oh, I'll have another stab at it, bets two or three dollars. The Queen Jack calls again. Rivers are blank and he checks. Uh, and then the button just decides to give up and checks and wins with ace high. So there we have um, the Queen Jack making several terrible mistakes. But first of all, in, if he had just bet the flop, he would have won what's in the pot. Uh, but instead of doing that, he called a bet by someone who definitely wouldn't, or he, who wouldn't have called a bet himself. And not only lost what was in the pot in the flop, because he could have won that, but he lost more bets that he called. Um, anyway. And he was calling bets there, but he wasn't going to get paid off. It wasn't if he happened to get lucky and hit his um, uh, eight or king, whatever he needed. Um, he wasn't going to get paid off because the other guy didn't have anything either. And there was no card that was going to give them both money. Um, here's an easy re-raise. He's raising a late position. Uh, I'm just going to follow this ace five here. Uh, that's an atrocious flop. Again, I, I'm kind of safe here because I don't think Tilted Rag would bluff me with Little Shop in the pot. His Little Shop has so little... I think if Tilted Rag bets here, he definitely has an ace. Well, not definitely, but almost definitely, so I'm just going to fold. It's a bit unfortunate, but um, there's no need to get caught up on it. So it's a disaster when you call a bet with a drawing hand against a technically inferior or technically superior holding. Um, you know, like an ace higher, king higher, or small pair, because... You could you could almost certainly win the pot with a bet yourself. So that's what you should do with draws. If you can't bet a draw yourself, you should probably fold it. Um, sometimes you should call if you think the guy's got a good hand or he's betting very small or something. But usually you will have had a chance to bet yourself anyway. Um, sorry, just looking at that hand there in the right. Um, so... In under norm, norm, nearly always, if I get a chance to, I'm going to bet a draw myself. Betting it yourself is so good because, as we I keep talking about, it's really important because it gives you the best chance to win the pot, and that's what's important. You don't worry about creating some situation where you can stack somebody, um, because you know that will kind of take care of itself. What you worry about is can I win this pot now? You know, because taking down the pot is what's important, um. Now, you need to make a rational analysis of whether a bet or a raise or whatever you need to do is going to be profitable. But you should always err towards that um, course of action rather than checking. So if I'm ever kind of in middle position or early position and I have a draw that's good enough to call a bet with, I'm going to bet myself. Uh, though, you know, Again, I'm generalizing here and there would be some times when it's better to call a bet. Uh, especially if someone's very aggressive or is very likely to have a good holding that will raise you, then you you want to just call about because you don't want to get priced out of the pot. Here with ace queen, mm, this is a kind of interesting scenario. Um, I'm definitely going to call. Um, so I bet the flop and get min raised. Um, I'm not sure what this means at that level. That's a pretty hefty bet. Um, unfortunately, I don't know this player, but I do need, I do need, I think I'm, yeah, I think I need to call this bet. I think it's very easy for him to fire out again with eights or nines here. I think I still, uh, I'm pretty good against his range. And uh, 
That's a good and a bad card. Obviously, yeah, I could have, I could be beaten by a flush now, but hopefully it will uh, scare him. Mm. Okay, so the, what's going through my head now is um, he has shown a pretty firm commitment to this pot. Um, I'm just going to go for a timer. He, you know, I think a lot of players, it's easy for them to continue on the turn. I don't know if it's so easy for them to continue on the river. And that 370 is kind of a sucker bet where he does want me to call. Um, and now any flush draws beats me, so I'm going to fold. This is my entire time bank. Fortunately, it doesn't show. Um, I would like to see the cards there. Uh, I probably would have called... Um, I probably would have called a bet on that river had it not been a club. But the, the fact that he bet out again, um, and he bet a good amount, it was half the pot, but at this level, I mean, that would be a pretty big bet. And um, the flush draw come in. So, uh, you know, on the turn, I, I don't beat sets, I don't beat straights, but I do beat flush draws. Um, you, you know, on the river, I don't beat flush draws anymore. So what I beat has gone down to a whole different level, uh, so I fold. Now, that said, I don't know that player, so I'm not 100% sure if I took the best line there. Um, some players are very tight, and once once they bet the turn, I can fold. Some players are very loose, and I kind of need to call the river no matter what it is. In fact, I can just raise the turn. Here on the right, uh, I've got an easy call. I'm actually going to look for a different table. Um, here on the left, I've got a pretty good pseudo connector. Um, and I've managed to flop a straight draw and flush draw. Um, on the right, I don't consider that ten dollar or the ten cents to be a bet. So I'm just going to raise because I would bet the turn myself if you checked. Um, now on the left, I was just saying you shouldn't um, check if you intend to call a bet. I didn't actually intend to call a bet there. Had he raised the. Uh, had he raised the flop, or sorry, had he bet the flop, I would have just uh, gone all in. My hand's really good. My hand obviously is rubbish now. I don't have anything. Um, I'm not going to try and bluff this guy. I don't think he's folding any pair. Okay. So I'm just going to look for another table quickly. I'll close this one. So the line I took about against that Street Kings guy would kind of be my um, standard line against a player I don't know. I don't think it's going to be a profitable call down the river. But that said, if I knew more about the player, um, I would have definitely veered in a different direction. You know, some very loose bad guys, I just raised the turn and expect them to call me with eights. You know, um, hmm. okay, so here I, I would like to call that. The problem is, yeah, it's just not going to be awful. It's just too much. Uh, I'm just going to post here to get in the action as quick as possible. As I explained in the last video, posting usually isn't a good idea. Um, but I'm just doing it because uh, I want to play as many hands as I can in the, in the short time of the video. Okay, so just like before, I flopped absolutely nothing. I'm going to go ahead and bet. Um, okay, I'm just going to fold. So it seems... Um, Seems at this level that um, players uh, seem to min raise the flop quite a bit. So, if that is true, um, then their ranges are obviously quite wide because if it happens a lot, you know, there's a lot of different hands could have. It's not necessarily very tight. Like I really didn't get the impression here against River Chase that he had a good hand. You know, he min raised so quickly, didn't really think about it. I would say he was either bluffing or had a top pair type hand. Okay, so that is on the right left, that's not a great board to continuation bet. Um that that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Um I'm still nearly always gonna fire a continuation bet on the flop. I just recognize that it's not the most profitable hand to do so. Okay, so we've talked about draws, we've talked about kind of pre-flop play and so on now. Now I kind of 
One of the things I like to do is um, try and take down pots that nobody else seems interested in. Uh, we haven't had too many examples of that yet. Hopefully we can try. So here, this is a fold, but I'm going to call because I, I, I want to get in a situation after the flop where maybe I can take it down. Because this is a good board to try and take it down. Um, it's very unlikely, it's very hard for anyone to have anything here. Um, River Chaser has just limped in. Because okay, so River Chaser seems very loose. Uh, I've turned to straight draw, sorry. I actually have some there. I'm going to go ahead and bet. At this stage, I'm just putting him on over cards. Possibly a flush draw. But he called so quickly that I don't think he has any hand at all. Um, he's in like King Jack. He just he automatically calls a bet. Hoping he can, you know, he, he doesn't really have a thought process. He just calls because that's what he does. But he may well, in if on a later sheet, try and take it away from me. So again, here on the left, uh, this this is a full preflop calling here is, is going to cost you money. But I'm going to call because I I want to um, get in these situations after the flop. Okay, so here I don't need to take a stab at it. I actually have something. Um, so, so, I mean, I don't need to bluff. I'm not bluffing here. I'm actually, in a way, value betting. But most of what I'm doing is trying to take the pot down. Because if I check there, all of a sudden it becomes hard for me to win the pot. Um, I check and he bets. I'm certainly not going to raise him. Um, I don't want to inflate the pot because I don't have much. Um, and if I just call, I'm all of a sudden I'm in. I'm, you know, I'm I'm in an awkward spot because if I just call there, I, I don't know anything about his hand except he wanted to bet the flop. It, nearly every card is a scare card. Any card above a ten is certainly a scare card because. You know, that's the type of hand I think he has. He could have something like 8-9 um, for a straight draw. Um, okay, so here on the left, uh, I probably wouldn't bet out if I didn't ha if I had nothing, considering uh, it happened the same last time. Uh, your chance of, of a bluff succeeding is always much less the second time. Uh, but I do have an open and a straight draw, so I'm going to bet. Uh, I've turned a straight. Uh, I think I need to protect it though. I don't give a diamond a free card. And I think uh, he'll be pretty uh, honest with me. Uh, here with the fours against two people, I'm just going to check. Uh, and he goes all in. Uh, I think this is a pretty easy fold. He could have a flush, although I think it's much more likely he has a jack. Yeah. Um. Here, you know, at a higher level, I might contemplate turning my hand into a bluff, but I think that, um, I just think that a 10 or a jack will call me, so there's no point in bluffing. There's some small chance I've got the best hand. Hmm. Mm. I can't really win once the guy calls. So I bet they're, knowing what, exactly what they have, uh, I bet they probably would have worked on the turn. Maybe I should have made it anyway. It's the type of bet I would normally make a high stakes, higher stakes, because I just don't think they have anything. I think they're going to fold. But uh, at this very low level, I think they're going to call with a 10 or a jack. I think they could have one. I wonder what they've called with a good shot and a six, possibly. Um, you know, whenever you make a bet or a bluff, well, whenever you make a bet, you should kind of know why you're making the bet. Um, are you bluffing? Are you value betting? Um, is it kind of a mixture of both? Are you, are you protecting the hand? Are you trying to take down the pot as early as possible? All those are, vi you know, they're, they're all um, viable uh, reasons to bet. Here I've got three bet. Um, it's the first time I've been three bet in this video. I don't think I was three bet in the last video. Mm. Maybe it was, but anyway, uh, you know, if you're never if you're never been three bet, then it's very likely. If you're very rarely been three bet, it's very likely people are only three bet you when they have aces or kings or greens. So uh, I'm just going to fold if I, unless I have a good hand. Um, there are all but viable reasons to bet, um, but you should have a reason. If if you don't have a reason to bet, if you can't come up with a reason to bet, you might, you're probably better off just checking. For example, I find what happens. Um, I see a lot of, of, of what I see a lot happening is uh, so I've been three bet again here in an obvious squeeze situation. 
if if I was playing two four one two, I'd almost certainly four bet. Um, but uh, yeah, as I said, I haven't been three bet very much. I don't even know if they if they squeeze very much down here or anything like that. So I'm just gonna fold. So we we'll get to see what you had here. Ace king. <laughs> two three. And two three he has ace king drawn dead. Okay, so um, he wasn't squeezing or, or making a life uh, too bad. He had a good hand, played it well. Um, I don't really know what 2 3 was doing. So, yeah, what I see people do a lot, what people do a lot is they make bluffs where they don't need to make a bluff. Uh, I'm definitely going to raise here. I, I think he just posted, uh, so he doesn't even have a, you know, he doesn't have a real hand. Uh, I have a good shot on two overs. Um well, I bet anyway. I now have a uh, open ended straight draw, but that is a great double barium card because, you know, a seven or a nine has to be now worried about a queen. Um. Okay. Mm. Oh. Yeah, okay, well, uh, so I was just got running through that in my head. Um, you know, I was certainly going to call there, it was just a min raise, as 180 to win, you know, what was going to be in the pot $20, so it's it's easy enough call with an open and straight draw. But I was just contemplating, do I have any fold equity if I go all in? Is that going to be a good play? Um, it's the type of thing I would do quite a lot at higher stakes, but um, I don't think it's a good idea here. Uh, I definitely should have called that. Um, okay. Oh, I just have to fall now. Ah, so so I've tapped up. Yeah. Okay, so let's just have a look at that hand again. Yeah, he when he min raises me there. I mean, what's going through my head is, you know, is he, you know, I really think there's a very good chance he is just trying to kind of take control of the pot with a seven or a nine. Uh, he doesn't actually have uh, that great a hand, but wants me to stop betting. Um, that's you know what I find that move a lot. So then I can go all in, and I you know I have quite a lot of equity against the seven or nine, so it's not a disaster if they call me. Um, you know, any eight, ten, or jack, uh, or king, uh, gives me the gives me the pot. But also, I'm really hoping he folds. But then I'm trying to work out, uh, or is just is this kind of just first level stuff? Is the min raise a monster hand, or like something like king queen, which is never going to fold? Um, so I was just thinking all through that, and uh, didn't really uh, didn't realize my time was as short as it was. Okay, so we're just coming to the end of the video. Um, we'll just go through the main key points again. Um, it's quite simple. Pre-flop and post-flop, you want to be the one betting, not the one calling. You want to be the one raising, not the one calling. Because anytime you bet, anytime you raise, you're giving yourself a good chance to win the pot. When you just call, the only chance you have to win the pot is if you win a showdown. And if you happen to get lucky to get enough to get to a showdown. Um, withdrawing hands you should almost never check them um, unless you intend on calling a bet. I'll come back to that somewhere in a minute. Uh, uh, this is one of the last few hands I'm going to play. This guy seems absolutely terrible. Obviously, you saw the 2-3 as well. Okay, so I'm going to do something I would rarely do. I, I wouldn't normally check there, but... Um, you, you know, it's quite... Uh, you give giving away your hand when you do that normally. But against a player this bad, I don't think he's capable of thinking that, that much too. So I'm just calling, hoping that, um, or just check, hope that either he makes a stupid bluff or he uh, catches something. Um, because, you know, on that board, 3-jack-7, I've kind of crippled the board to a certain extent. It's very hard for him to have anything. Um, that's, that exact hand is something I really would not recommend doing. The re-raising pre-flop, then checking the top set. 
because you're giving away the shot of your hand. But against a player that awful, you don't need to worry about giving away your hand. I mean, you could probably show him what you had and he'd still call you. Oh, and hit it in a nice sort of thing. Um, anyway, so with drawing hands, try and win them yourselves. Um, don't check a drawing hand with with you, uh, with which you intend to call a bet. Um, try and win as many small pots as you can. I'll just set out of these tables. Try and take down as many small pots as you can, uh, especially in limp pots. Think about the range that people are limping in with, and what type of texture of boards are good um, to try and bluff with. And, um, you know, bet out with small bits of the flop, not really bluffing, just trying to take the pot down. Um, and always in your mind should be, you don't want to get too aggressive. Um, it, these things are profitable because you don't expend too many chips. Um, you just spend, expend a, a profitable amount and you don't try and get people to fold big hands because they won't, it's, it, it's, it won't work. Um, you know, once you realize somebody has something in it, kind of back off, you know, it's all about kind of taking little jabs at pots, just finding out where people are weak and going after them and rarely actually extending yourself. Um, what, you know, what the progression I went through as a player was, you know, once I learned to play and got a little bit aggressive, I took that way overboard and I was way too aggressive because I realized that you could take down nearly any pot, but it was costing me so many chips when I didn't take it down about that it was kind of costing me money in a way. And the, you know, how I've evolved as a player since then has been a kind of gradual ebb and flow of aggression. Um, where, and I've, you know, I've come recently, well, in the kind of last year and a half to a level where I think I have a very good feel for when a bluff, um, is going to be successful because I have a feeling like, oh, his range here is just too strong. It's not going to be worth betting. Or no, his range here is quite weak. Um, as you saw in the hand where I triple barreled with the, the, I think, well, I think I had jack nine just because the overcard came in the turn and the uh, flush draw came on the river. Plus, I thought he was calling me quite light because of my aggression in previous hands. So I thought, yeah, this is going to be a profitable bluff. Even though I'm playing very low limits against someone who's probably you know an absolute beginner i thought that was going to be profitable uh, bluff it's situations like that that was something i'd rarely do and it was because a number of factors came into play um but normally once a player called the two bets i just say fine he's you know he's signaled a firm intention you know a firm uh, investment in the pot uh, i don't think a bluff is going to be uh profitable so all that is a long roundabout way of saying don't become over aggressive um, give up when you encounter stiff resistance you know it's about the volume of pots you win you know and so you know sometimes it's fine to let yourself be rebluffed um things like that uh just you know try not to invest too many chips um in your bluffs okay so um if you enjoyed this video you should check out the, the rest of them uh, that's me signing out thanks a lot